Arab Tov, everyone, good evening. We're uh, excited to see some of you for the second in the series. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome to B'nai Jeshurun virtually. Um, this is the second in a series as we are anticipating the holiday of Shavuot, where we receive the Torah once again, and we're in a very particular year um, of a lot of change, a lot of discovery, a lot of challenge. And as we anticipate a new Torah coming down for us on Shavuot, we really wanted to explore the larger questions of um, where are we, what have we learned, and uh, how do we think about uh, moving into the future with all the unrest that we've been living with. And so we were blessed to bring in to this conversation um, Ari Wallach, who's an American futurist and the founder and executive director of Long Path, an initiative fostering long-term thinking and behavior in the individual, organizational, and societal realms. And Ari was with us and in conversation with Roly and um, me last uh, two weeks ago, and we're excited to have him back as he curates a conversation with um, experts in various fields so we can think about the short long-term path which are what are some of the mega trends happening in society and how can we think about what we've learned this year and move forward faithfully into what's a really unknown future but also has certain trends um, and so I'll hand it over to Ari uh, to begin the conversation with our panelists tonight. Thank you, Felicia. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us again tonight. Uh, those of you who are joining us on Zoom and through the live feed through Facebook and through YouTube, uh, the last conversation we had, I thought, I don't know about my, I don't know about my role in it, but I thought it was great with Felicia and Rolly. Kind of, we talked about not obviously just the future and that we have to start kind of thinking long term and how do we do that in this moment. And we also talked about a little bit about kind of the past and how the past informs the future. And as you may recall, what came up a few times was this idea of mega trends. And, and we talked about it, it was brief, we went through it very quickly, but I wanna kind of bring us back to that because they're really, really important. It's gonna kind of be in many ways what we use to foster the conversation tonight. Um, uh, Dave is gonna put up some, uh, a list of mega trends. And, and while he, when he puts that up on the screen, what's important to note about mega trends is, here it is, they're coming up. So these are long path mega trends and lots of different organizations have their mega trends. These are the ones that we use. And what, what is so important to recognize and to understand about mega trends is a couple of things and I'm gonna go through them. One, mega trends are these key drivers. They're not necessarily, it's not about predicting the future. Mega trends don't predict anything. They're really kind of, if you think about it, it's the foundation of which, in which we build the future on top of. Many of these are not just years, but decades in the making. That's one thing that's very important to know. They, these are not, you know, every year Pantone, the company that makes colors, they come out with their color of the year. There is no mega trend of the year, right? These are more often than not kind of human made. They're not necessarily good or bad. They can be neutral and we work with them. And what mega trends do is for folks like me, who's my day job, is to help folks think about the future and how to shape the future. Is they they become not just these foundational pillars, but almost like guardrails, so that we don't kind of become kind of Pollyannish and say, "Well, we want the world to look like this," and forget forget the past and and let's start from blank or like a, a clean slate. That that never is necessarily the reality. So what megatrends also do is they ground us, right? So when we think about the world that we are shaping or the one that we are reacting to, um, and those are two different sides that we'll get to later on in this conversation with this illustrious group of folks, is that they help us really think in a very strategic long-term way. The other thing about megatrends I want you to note, and you'll see when, when books come about megatrends, it's usually, usually about technology or, or, or science. You'll see down the middle of your screen, that is some of the mega trends are science and technology, but it's also social and cultural shifts, demographic, environmental and political dynamics. So it's not just technology. And we talked about that in the last conversation we had that more often than not, when we think about the future, it's through this kind of 
technological lens. So what megatrends also help us do is kind of break out of that, I, I don't want to say uh, almost tunnel vision towards what tomorrow could be, because tomorrow could be a lot of things that don't necessarily touch technology, although they're, they're very, very important. And so what we're going to do tonight is try to kind of break out of this breaking news kind of presentism mentality, which is kind of what we're all stuck in, where we're kind of like on this, 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 this hamster wheel, if you will, where things don't seem to change and they're happening very quickly. But what megatrends allow you to do is kind of step back. And when I was talking to Roy and Felicia, and we were talking about, well, for our second evening together, who do we want to bring together to kind of not just hear the theory of megatrends, because that's what I do. It's a lot of theory talk. I, what, like, who are the people who are actually thinking about these and using them and shaping them and really kind of interweaving their work, whether or not they call it megatrends or not, but who are grounded in the reality of the world as it is, but understand there's more than just technology to play with in terms of how we want to shape the future. So, so with that, enough of kind of Ari Wallach, and I want to kind of get into this and do some introductions. Um, so, so, so first off, I'm going to read some of these. They're really impressive. Uh, I'm really kind of shocked they all said yes to me, to be honest with you. Um, so Majora Carter is somewhere on your screen. She's right next to me on mine, but she's right over here. Uh, is, I'm going to read these because they're just, I don't want to miss a word. Is the Senior Program Director of Groundswell's Justice 40 Accelerator designed to ensure that 40% of the $2 trillion clean energy infrastructure funds that are gonna be deployed by this administration are to disadvantaged communities. And she'll get more into what that means, but it's a brilliant strategy uh, when, when you hear it. She's also a real estate developer, urban revitalization strategy consultant, and a MacArthur Fellow. And it says MacArthur Fellow because they don't like it when you call it MacArthur Genius Fellows. But, but that when you hear about the genius folks, that's, that's what Jora is. She's one of those. But they, they, they hate when you say it in front of them, but I'm going to say it. And that's it's too bad. She has to hear me say it. Um, she's also doing a whole bunch of other stuff that we're going to get into. Uh, next up in this kind of Brady Bunch box is Don Chen, who's the president of the Cerdna Foundation, where he leads the 100-year-old foundation's efforts to strengthen and further leverage its commitment to social justice. Prior to his appointment, Dom was a director of the Cities and States Program at the Ford Foundation, which many of you guys know uh, is on 43rd Street, a uh, beautiful building, landmark building, where his work supported urban development initiatives to make housing more affordable. Previously, Dom was the founder and CEO of Smart, of Smart Growth America and a whole bunch of other stuff, uh, which is totally amazing. So I suggest you kind of look into it. Don's a little bit, I'm a little bit of a fanboy of Don. Uh, next up, my good friend, Dr. Holly Rizone Gilman, who is somewhere in the Brady Bunch. Um, I've known Holly for a very long time. I actually co-taught a class with her at Columbia. She's a political reform program fellow at the New America Foundation and the Ho Foundation fellow at Columbia World Projects. She's also an affiliate fellow at the Harvard's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. She most recently was a co-author with another friend, Sabil Ram, who was at Demos but has now joined the administration of a book called Civic Power, Rebuilding American Democracy in the Era of Crisis. She also, of course, served in the Obama White House as the Open Government and Innovation Advisor. And last but not least is a new friend of mine, Dr. Wendy Greenspun, who, um, well, I'll go into it, but I, I'll do my commentary after. She's on the faculty of the Manhattan Institute Certificate Program in Psychoanalysis and Adelphi University's postgraduate program in marriage and couples therapy. Now, let's check this out. She has written and presented internationally on ways psychologists and psychoanalysts can engage with the climate crisis and has taught courses on eco-psychoanalysis. She has also provided workshops and classes for university students. She is a supervising psychologist at Columbia University's Counseling and Psychological Services and is in private practice in Manhattan. So I want to thank all of them uh, for joining us, and it's 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 really an honor. And where I want to start, and I'll and I'll start with with Don first. And by the way, as as you know, there are chat questions you can drop in there. I'll be referring to those. I have my own questions. The way this is going to run is not just me kind of moderating, firing questions, but you'll notice there will be some crosstalk between uh, the panelists because the idea is more of a dinner party conversation than a classic moderate conversation. So I'm gonna start with Don Chen. Don, um, 
give us, I, I, re I read the bio and bios are always really interesting and they're fascinating and they're usually written by someone who we pay to write really great things about us. That means that, tell me, tell us a little bit more about what you're working on now and, uh, and, and, and in some ways, how you got to wanting to work on these issues because they're big issues. Thank you, Don. Um, thank you, Ari, and thank you everybody for having me today and having our, our all of our guests. Uh, it's it's a real honor. Um, I'll tell you about the Cerdna Foundation and uh, just a little backstory on me that's not in the bio. I was funded by the Cerdna Foundation, you know, from when I was in my early twenties till I was about you know, forty years old, uh, and uh, that's because. Uh, my career was built on trying to work on uh, affordable housing, environmental justice, transportation policy, infrastructure, those types of urban development and, and urban uh, policy issues. And that's what the Cerdna Foundation was uh, very well known, known for back in the 90s and the 2000s. Um, and uh, so it's you know fairly roundabout route, but I ended up uh, becoming the president of the Cerdna Foundation two and a half years ago, and I feel extremely lucky having gone through that journey. Um, my, in my, in my uh, day job, uh, what I do is I try to run the foundation um, through a period, what, what's been a period of transformation. Uh, the foundation, uh, unlike most foundations, has stuck with its core programs for many, many years. It has had a program on sustainable environments for about 35 years, uh, one on inclusive economics, although it has had different names, but one on economic inclusion for about the same amount of time, one on art, arts and culture, and then uh, one on youth justice reform, which is you know like criminal justice reform, but for young people. Um, and um, we have stayed pretty steady on those programs. Um, steadily over the decades, we have focused more and more on social justice and racial justice. Uh, and that became even more pronounced after I uh, came to CERDNA. Um, and so we've been trying to make adjustments uh, to realize that vision. How do you really transform your grant making and the types of grantees that you support and the way we conduct ourselves as people in the phil philanthropic sector? And also how we bring some of those lessons into our organization and, and how do we walk the talk um, in terms of human resources, in terms of you know, hiring and retention and all those types of things that um, you know, do represent the everyday running of an organization like ours. So that's kind of the day to day. Um, at the same time, there's always something dramatic uh, that is happening in the world or in the, our community. Uh, that we often feel the need to respond to. And right now, this last few months, I've been putting a lot of effort into uh, trying to organize folks, trying to participate in responses to anti-Asian violence um, and uh, supporting a number of organizations from the grassroots to national networks uh, to try to uh, develop stronger responses uh, in, in light of all the violence and harassment discrimination that we've seen. Um, and then finally, uh, one thing that's fairly perennial, but is, uh, you know, uh, I would say really specific to certain, and that is, I spent a lot of time focusing on how to get family foundations, especially long standing foundations. Ours is 104 years old. Um, how can we get uh, our network of family members who are overwhelmingly white? Uh, to really understand, appreciate, and also lean themselves into our racial justice mission. There's about 500 members of the Andrus family, all descended from the original founder of the foundation. And so we've been developing all these educational programs to try to bring them along and, and uh, respond to their needs to understand uh, the circumstances that we're trying to, um, uh, that we're trying to uh, be involved in. So uh, those are a couple of the, you know, the long, the, the steady things and some of the, um, the more recent things that uh, I've been very involved in. Awesome. Uh, I, I'm writing down questions as, you, as you're going. So you see me looking down. I'm not looking down at my toes. I'm actually looking down at my clipboard. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over to Majora uh, to give us just, uh, again, what are the, the, the things that you're working on specifically with, with this newest with Groundswell, but I also know you're touching some other things. If you could talk about that, that'd be great. Of course, thank you. Thanks for 
having me. So yeah, I am brand spanking new uh, at Groundswell. This is literally my seventh day um, before I was invited to participate in this program, which literally is designed to increase the, the capacity and actually, honestly, the just the presence of disadvantaged communities, you know, actually participating at the federal level and actually getting that funding because it is about the money. That's really what this is about, um, specifically to impact the, you know, some get 40% of the resources that are going to be going through the Biden-Harris administration for clean energy infrastructure so that there could actually be a real change within the communities that are often we they they, ne they can't even really participate, frankly, you know, to for, for that kind of federal funding. But we're here to help, literally. So I am was extremely honored to have been tapped, you know, by the folks um, because you to do that work. And it's five different groups who are involved. Ground Groundswell is the one that's been working on community solar, but really building their 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 motto is um, uh, or their mission is to build community power. They do it through the solar industry, but basically is a support, you know, the folks there, you know, whether it's through, you know, the development, you know, of, of alleviating energy burdens or things of that nature. But ultimately, it's like, how do they do that? You know, and especially in light of, of this this new era that they're in with with Biden Harris and, and a real interest in actually undoing some of the wrongs that have traditionally happened to communities. But uh, the reason why I was tapped for this is because I have more than a 20 year history you know, working literally as a as a urban revitalization strategist and now as a real estate developer and you know my reason for living was literally to prove that you don't have to move out of your community to live in a better one which is not exactly the kind of thing that one thinks of when think when people think of most marginalized communities um i work we apply something that we call a talent retention strategy to the work that we do and and it's lit all that means is, is we work to look at the folks that are in our own communities that are in the kind of communities that are what we call low status and by low status what i don't mean is that there's something just inherently wrong you know with the folks that are in those communities um what it means is that in those communities those folks are it's just inequality is is assumed by people both inside and outside the neighborhoods. And so they could be Native American reservations, it could be inner cities, it could be, you know, former Rust Belt towns where and um, you know the 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 big economic boom was long gone. And so it's really important to note those are the places where the health outcomes are worse, where um, education attainments lower, people are more you know involved with the justice system in one way, shape, or form. Again, inequality is simply assumed. You know, and then there's there's the issue with the whether it's the the nonprofit industrial complex or our government that literally continues to treat those communities as problems to be solved, as opposed to you know sort of like wrapped up you know the people that are in those communities you know I, I really do embody and have you know at their disposal hopes and dreams and aspirations just like everybody else. But again, in those neighborhoods, you know after years of philanthropic spending, government spending, things don't get any better. So our approach really has been to recognize that within those communities, people are the keys to their own recovery. So, and we do it through the very specific approaches to recognizing that one, the talent is already in that community. And so we, we tend to sort of apply this approach that looks like the same way if you were a company and you pour talent, and you, excuse me, you poured resources into your staff, why? Because you wanna make sure they stay. You want them to feel that their, their well being is tied up to yours. But we don't do that in American low status communities. We do the exact opposite. Matter of fact, we assume that we are teaching folks to measure success by how far they get away from those communities. So we use real estate development as a tool to literally like remind people that there is opportunities in, available in their own communities, but we have to build that. So we've done that, you know, from working on, you know, something as simple as opening up a cafe so that people in our communities actually have a place to hang out and discover that there's creativity and talent and beautiful things happening in their own neighborhood in the form of their own neighbors. Um, but if you don't have those things, you can't do it. Um, we're working only on mixed, mixed use and mixed um, um, income housing because the concentration of poverty that unfortunately, I think the nonprofit industrial complex has actually done in low status communities um, really exacerbates all of the issues associated with poverty low health outcomes, educational attainment, and all that. And so we're really kind of proposing an alternative path 
that comes straight from there. And so I'm also so excited that at this point, you know, we're working specifically with on um, as as one of my new capacity, um, you know, is to really like take all of the things that many, whether they are environmental justice groups, you know, economic equality groups, really thinking about how are there the future well-being and fortunes, but whether it's health, well, you know, economic and otherwise, and of course on the energy side, how is it tied up to actually being able to access the kind of funds that have literally, you know, before this not been a part of it, of they were not players in this at all. So part of our job is to make sure that we're bringing in the resources and making sure those resources are allocated so that they can actually participate in a, at a level which unfortunately because of the structural inequality that is embedded in this country we were unable to do so but, but god willing that is all going to change and, and it's fascinating it, it, it's a, it's a thank you majora um it, it's a excellent segue to to holly because th this idea that we think about these megatrends this idea about um participation and, and the different forms of participation takes. And as we think about kind of the challenges that we're gonna be facing over the next five months, five years, 10, 20, 30 years, participation in many ways seems to be at the crux of that, right? And so Holly, who has uh, both worked in the field as a field organizer, but also in uh, at the White House academic level, Holly, give us a little bit about the, the big picture work that you're kind of working on right now, how you got there and, and, and how you see um, these issues playing out. And we'll get to the more longer term stuff in a second, but just, just as an introduction, because I think that's a perfect segue around participation. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me, Ari. And it's so nice to be here with the congregation and such amazing panelists. Um, Donna Majora, it's so great to hear from both of you and the work you're doing. And we have some family members also on the call in the congregation. So we're very happy to be here. So, you know, it's, it's a really good segue, Ari. And as, as you were sort of talking about, you know, the inequality that's played communities on a structural level, I was thinking about the work that I've been doing and, you know, looking at the mega trend in particular around the decline of sort of political institutions and thinking about, you know, the decline of traditional institutional power here on the mega trend slide. A lot of my work thinks about these questions of, you know, the lack of trust and lack of legitimacy that we're seeing in our democratic institutions and against a backdrop of historical inequities and systemic racism in the United States and thinking about how do you think anew of what really a truly multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy would look like in this country? And what would it look like if we tapped into the power and creativity of people in their local communities? So just thinking about this past year, everything from mutual aid networks to people sort of coming together in new ways, including digitally, and thinking about where are the opportunities for building you know, what we call in the civic power book, hooks and levers, where you're really building these ways for community members to have a more robust say in policy making and policy outcomes. And not in a way that is just lip service or a PR campaign or a nice to have, but in a way that actually builds civic power and civic voice, where there are feedback mechanisms back into those very communities. And so a lot of my work right now has been working with leaders in cities and communities who want to be more innovative and want to be more open to experimentation, but there are so many challenges from you know, deficits, fiscal deficits, to just sort of not knowing what the toolkit looks like. And so that's been sort of where I've been finding a lot of opportunity is to sort of share these lessons learned from the field and sort of, you know, when participatory budgeting works in one context, what are the lessons that we can learn in another community while keeping it really locally grounded in that community and its narratives and its sort of challenges and sort of holding both of those things at the same time and sort of thinking, you know, this is a moment of opportunity in the United States at least. And, you know, one of the things I've been looking at is a concept called civic infrastructure. And so thinking about what is the civic infrastructure that we need in our communities and can we think about you know building that scaffolding and building that connective tissue around sort of whether it's our parks and rec centers and parks were so important in this past year or public libraries and the value that they're taking on to 
you know, really supporting catalytic leaders. And if you were to sort of redesign civic infrastructure from the ground up, and Don, I really appreciated what you were saying, you know, thinking about legacy foundations and and I, I like the uh, industrial uh, nonprofit complex or however the phrase was that you used. I thought that was very good. Um, you know, you know, when we think about building new philanthropy models, like is it Venmoing someone, you know, a few thousand dollars who's a catalytic leader in their community? You know, that's just sort of, that's just one example amongst many, but sort of how do you create the scaffolding? How do you find those leaders? How do you create more diverse pipelines? These are kind of some of the big questions that I'm thinking about because on the one hand you see this chasm between these sort of scaloric institutions and they're not really fit for the governing challenges that we have. And on the other hand, you see people every day in their communities coming together to problem solve and to sort of strengthen and support one another. And so can you sort of build some connective tissue between those two? Uh, wow. Um, I, I'm still surprised they let me moderate this. So it's, it's great because, you know, Holly, you're talking about civic infrastructure and, but what it makes me also think about is that's the, the, if we kind of layer this, right? So there's these kind of larger infrastructures, we think of bridges and tunnels, and there's civic infrastructure in these parks. And, but there's, there's another layer, there's another infrastructure that sometimes uh, using majority term, the nonprofit industrial complex or philanthropy or government will kind of look over. And that's like the deepest infrastructure, right? It's like the infrastructure of the self and the individual and how we are able to be resilient both in, in times of acute crisis, but also larger systemic when these there are mega trends that are kind of overtaking us. And that, that leads me to, to Wendy. And Wendy, if you could obviously in, in this within the same vein, introduction both of yourself and the work that you're doing, but also I think how this kind of the, these, these mega trends around um, things that are changing and flexing and obviously climate being kind of the tent pole, how that's playing out you see both in the world and in your work. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ari. And um, I'm so honored to be here with all of these really incredible uh, panelists. And as a therapist in private practice, I do a lot of listening. And so I'm always excited when I actually get to talk. So this, this is my, my few moments anyway. Um, so I, uh, there's so much to say here. I got very interested in the climate crisis, just personally, my own distress, my own concerns as, you know, worse and worse news was coming out about uh, we have 12 years left, you know, the IPCC report a few years ago, 12 years left to make substantial changes. And yet we are sort of limping along and slowly moving. And here I am a therapist who helps people change, right? Face difficulties, face painful truths, face um, really horrible things to have to grapple with. Um, so what can I do? And I felt pretty helpless and I thought about it for many years. And finally, researched and found there are climate psychologists. There are people in this field who are actually taking on these important questions. So I have become part of what is now a growing network of clinicians who are looking at this. Um, and I'm part of the, on the board of the Climate Psychology Alliance of North America, uh, which is really taking on the task of trying to educate other clinicians because we are seeing in our practices, in the consulting room, and in families and communities, increasing levels of distress as people are encountering awareness of the climate and environmental emergency, as well as suffering the impacts of it. So especially in poor and marginalized communities, we are already seeing people um, you know, facing poor air quality, uh, toxic waste, you know, so that the embedded social problems and systemic racism, it's all part and parcel of the same climate and environmental crisis. Um, so I feel very honored to be able to try to have an impact on both the small scale, so in my office with people who are struggling and suffering, trying to do some work helping uh, climate activists and climate scientists and students who are really on the front lines of facing the really horrible realities and feeling so much distress. Um, 
young people who are feeling like older people have let them down and they're leaving the problem for their generation. Young people who are saying, I don't know if I can have children. Um, I don't think it's fair to bring children into this world given the, the world we're facing. So, so much distress. Um, and then also taking on some of the issues of what is it that makes it so hard for people to, ch to change and what can we do about that? Um, are there ways to sort of break into the complicated mixture of feelings that people want to keep life good as we have it, making progress, um, enjoying life, but, but not reckoning with the consequences of our actions, not seeing it that we're part of a larger system, that we're interconnected. Think about in the COVID crisis with vaccination, we can be proud in this country that there's a lot of vaccines and people are getting vaccinated. India is suffering. If we don't help India, then what happens to our country as the virus mutates? If we keep disconnecting ourselves from the ways that we are all in together, it, it makes a very, very big difference. So I'm really trying to approach a lot of these uh, issues. We do things like um, climate cafes, which is our groups of, of people in communities who get together just to process some of the difficult emotions around the climate crisis and the intersecting problems of systemic racism, colonialism, the patriarchy, all kinds of isms that are intersecting um, and helping with the emotions. Because if you don't face the emotions, you tend to push it away and push the whole problem away. So you have to have a way to bear the worst of the feelings and the emotions, um, but not be overwhelmed by them. And so that's what I see a lot of my work uh, doing at this point. It's amazing. Um... And it's, you know, hearing it, hearing these like different layers, it reminds me when I was a kid, we used to drive from the Bay Area to Lake Tahoe, even, even though no one skied, my dad played blackjack, right? And so there's a, there's a part where you're driving on 80 up through the mountains of the Sierras where they've carved through the rocks and you see these kind of tectonic layers and you see that over time, different things have, have, have formed on top of each other. And I think in, in hearing from all of you, I'm kind of seeing the, the, this matrix of how we both analyze issues, but then also how, how we tackle them. I'm curious, Majora, in, in, he, in hearing all of this and the work that you're doing that is very much um, both previously and now grounded in location and place, is, is, is there the room to kind of think about more than just what the needs are right now? And if not, how do we create more of that room, both within kind of disadvantaged, marginalized communities uh, and kind of in general as, as you're hearing this? I mean, I think Wendy kind of hit the nail on the head. I mean, when people, you know, we don't see ourselves as a whole and we certainly don't see ourselves, you know, as, you know, maybe it's, it's like, you know, the whole individual, you know, the rugged individual, you know, that makes up, you know, the, the popularized in American culture when none of, when, when you stop and realize it's like, y'all couldn't get a cup of coffee if it wasn't for the interdependence of the, of the world. And let's just be real about that. And uh, We're at the door. we don't see that we don't see it that way mm -hmm. at all. And, um, you know, and I think especially when it comes to low status communities, I mean, they're just completely othered, or we're just completely othered because I am from still live in, born, red, will still live there. Um, and, uh, you know, and that in and of itself, you know, is, is I think, the core, you know, of the reason, one of the reasons why, like, things are just as bad as they are. I mean, I got to tell you, 2020 was, was horrible in every, every way, don't want to repeat it, but I feel like at the very least, what it did do was create an opportunity for folks to be like, oh my God, there actually are real reasons why, you know, people of color, in particular black folks, don't do so well. Oh, I had no idea. And I feel like the more we can actually like, it, and, 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 I don't, and honestly, I don't think the world's going to change so much where people are going to go like, well, we're really going to do something about it. I think some people will. And for that, I think maybe it's people on this call. Um, but for the most part, I feel as though, you know, it's going to take the ones who decide that, you know what, I am going to look beyond, you know, just my comfortable circle 
and actually do something so that I could actually be really truly human. And I'm hopeful that enough of us will do that. Well, that's really interesting because I love what you were saying about how you know you can't get a cup of coffee without the interdependence of the whole global chain. And and Wendy, your comments about India and like, so it's like how and then you and majority you like literally took the words out of my mouth. I was thinking, so how how can we how can people feel empowered, right? How do we sort of explain the system and systemic inequities and racism and the challenges of the global climate change and interdependence. And it can feel like almost too overwhelming, right? You can feel like mm-hmm. I'm just going to stay in bed all day if you have that luxury and not everyone does. So it's kind of a tension for me is how do we empower people while being realistic and understanding that it's kind of like individual individuals atomized is not enough, but with our institutions crumbling and with such challenges around institutions, we can't like just leave it to them and others to figure out and kind of that tension. I think that's so important and that you really are, Majora, you uh, as well as Holly and Don, you also were talking about the importance of communities. So how do we work within communities, listen to communities, and uh, meet people where they are and where their values are and find the values that help bring people together and want to do more. Um, Because I think a lot of times people do feel overwhelmed and helpless and too small to make a difference. Um, But it's, it's sort of those social tipping points we talk about sometimes that it's not just, you know, other kinds of tipping points, but you, you have to kind of keep amassing more and more um, people to make a difference. And so that's where I think a lot of the power comes in. And also by joining in communities, people don't feel so helpless that like, like the social support of it also creates the ongoing impetus to keep trying. One of the things that came out of uh, the, this pandemic um, during the early days and, and continuing um, is this term mutual aid. Uh, and it's a term that I had, hadn't really uh, heard much of in the past, but you know, suddenly people were talking about mutual aid and um, it was really striking to me what the meaning of it uh, is. And that is that people found ways to help each other uh, without expecting you know, big government agencies to come and deliver help or um, you know, foundations like ours or other entities, they were just trying to help each other. Um, and so and a lot, I saw a lot of foundations responding to that and basically trying to send resources to folks who were providing that mutual aid. We had some longstanding uh, grantees who normally don't do that type of work. They, you know, like the Indigenous Environmental Network, uh, which is a network of Native Americans who work on environmental justice issues. Um, they normally work on organizing, uh, you know, public policy, education, uh, those types of things. But because they had connections to communities that were so horribly affected by COVID, especially during the early um, uh, many months, uh, they really quickly shifted their operations to deliver things like water and uh, medical supplies and PPE uh, and those types of things. And when I think about that lesson and I think about what's happening across the globe, uh, it makes me wonder, you know, and this is thinking very long, long into the future, um, as we confront the challenges of climate change, of, you know, another pandemic or multiple pandemics in the future and other things that will be incredibly disruptive, um, can we fashion um, an agreement like a, 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 a real change in our understanding of our connectedness so that we can provide mutual aid to each other. Uh, and, you know, we do a semblance of that or we pretend to do that through things like international aid. Um, but, you know, climate's going to affect all of us. It's going to affect North America. Uh, it's going to affect Australia. And so we're going to need each other to get through this. And so, so Don, um, and, and I'm going to put this to Don, I'll go, I'll start back with you, Don, but touching on, again, going back to, I'm going to go referring back to the, one, of the, the, one of the mega trends, the decline of traditional institutional power, right? And we're seeing that, and we're seeing the, the flip side of that is a, a kind of a, a populist or a neo-populist revolt, because folks are looking for 
some for a narrative, right? And, and institutions to kind of hold them. And we, we don't have those in the traditional way. So when you think about how you're gonna be doing your funding with an eye towards the next five, 10, 15 years of, of a fluxing world, how do you think about that? Like, how do you, because there's, there's the folks that you need to fund right now that you have been funding, but as we look at the mega trends, things are changing. So then therefore, how do you rethink who you fund and, and, and how do you provide that vision without being too top down? And I'm gonna go from you over to Majora because she's been on the other end of kind of receiving or having to deal with that type of funding apparatus as we think about the next five, 10, 15 years. Um, yeah, well, that's, I think that's super relevant. Um, you know, I think about Holly's book that she co-wrote with Sabil and it's called Civic Power. And um, so many of the lessons that uh, they write about are practices that um, many of us have tried to adopt. You know, th those of us who are involved in social justice philanthropy um, and thinking about the future too, it's and uh, really trying to shift and redistribute power uh, to people at the community level. Uh, not hold power, you know, hoard power at the philanthropic level or, you know, big elite institutions, but recognizing that it's important for our democracy, it's healthy for our democracy to have this shift occur. And as Majora said, um, I love I love what you said earlier. You said that, that people are the keys to their, their own recovery. And um, I think not only do I believe in that, but there's tons of evidence that uh, that is a more long-term sustainable and powerful way to, to build uh, a strong recovery. Um, and in the face of waning institutional power, I, by the way, still believe in institutions. Like I think they're so terribly important and their power needs to be derived from civic power. Um, I think that's something that we all need to work on. Um, so as a foundation that believes in this type of work uh, and tries to fund accordingly, it means that we need to let go of some of our, you know, uh, our, our own power. Um, uh, there's an, another new book called Letting Go, which just came out uh, by a couple of really thoughtful folks um, uh, about participatory grant making uh, and how it's important to, uh, just like participatory budgeting and, you know, other, other practices, um, important to draw from the wisdom and, and actually, you know, put in place, you know, people who are from the community in positions of decision-making power um, so they can guide resources that might come from a traditional foundation. Um, I think those are some of the lessons that we're learning. And I think that um, helps give us good guidance for um, how foundations can operate in the future. Majorda, how, how does this dovetail with the industrial complex and whether or not folks can let go and, and how do you build that power in locally when it seems to be those quote unquote on the outside don't necessarily want to let go of that power. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with anything that, that Don said, like on a substantive level. However, the reality is, it's that it's still very much, you know, this, this, this sort of idea that we need to support, you know, communities in this way that ultimately is very different from the way that we know real success looks like in this country. Like the bottom line is, you know, white men in America got a particular way, you know, and support their families, you know, through the through creating generational wealth. I want what white men have for low status communities, period. And if we're not working toward that, then I don't know what we're doing. I really don't. And, and I feel like basically, you know, from, I literally just wrote a book, okay. Um, and it's due out in February, 2020, two actually next year. And, and it's, uh, it's called Reclaiming Your Community. You don't have to move out of your neighborhood to live in a better one. And it literally is about, you know, my, my successes and failures in creating a different path for community development that often is not utilized, you know, within low status can almost never utilize it in low status communities and, and until unless they get gentrified, um, which is not exactly the, the point. The point is like, how do you create, you know, the, the capacity within communities so that they can take care of themselves. But ultimately, it really is about not just having a seat at the table. 
It's like having access to resources that would allow them to build the kind of community that would allow the, us to prosper, you know, not just financially, although that's a huge thing, but also, you know, socially and emotionally and spiritually, you know, which is what is, is literally taken away or, or not taken away, but it becomes harder and harder to do that every single day in low status communities. It's why, whether it's climate change or a pandemic, um, guess what? Those communities are most vulnerable. I don't care what you call it. It's like, it's always going to impact us a lot more. And again, really keep in mind that it's not just inner cities. It is actually poor white people too. And, and I, you know, I'm in Georgia right now. So I've literally just seen, you know, enough of these communities go by and, um, and it's a really difficult, you know, space to be in, but I still feel as though that the, the sort of traditional MO, you know, of, of how we, we treat those communities, we don't really expect them to thrive. And, and we, and we could see that, you know, considering the wealth gap, you know, the way our, you know, in particular black bodies are not considered important in any real level. And so what we've done really isn't working. You know, I'm with the Justice 40 initiative right now, and it's literally, it is, it, it is a way to specifically address that access, you know, to the resources that could literally support our community have not come our way, just not. And if we're, and, and but if we're honest about it, you know, we go, okay, so what can we do to make it happen? And unfortunately, I think that we have an administration now who's at least interested in it, but it is going to take a lot to make sure that it actually happens the way that it's supposed to. And so this, this, this begs, this begs a question, um, Wendy, and, and I, and I want to caveat this by, I, I'm asking this question, not by putting the blame on anyone in any community, but what is it, and I, it's, it's a big question, that prevents this kind of letting go of the narratives of, you know, whether it's, expectations about not necessarily wanting folks to thrive because of savior complex or what is it like as you're seeing this what is it that holds us back right i'm asking the, the biggest like union probably question i can think of right now but like like because it's like let it because i think of don saying like let it go and i'm like yeah i want to let there's so much i want to let go of everything from a certain way that we think we should live or what success looks like as we're moving into this fluxing climate change moment and we we've, we've let go of a lot of things i think over the past 14 months not that there's any silver linings but if there's a, a micro one it's some of us are able to let go of certain things but writ large what do, what do you feel is holding us back from letting go of those things that are keeping us from from helping shape in a participatory equitable way these more flourishing futures Wow, <laughs> that's a big, that's a very big and complicated question. Um, I, I think there are many things. I think uh, we are, our, our brains are wired to protect us from any perceived kind of threat and threat can be seen as anything that shifts the, the status quo. Uh, so we will want to uh, prevail and push against you know, whatever feels threatening. And that can be a part of the self too, like a vulnerable or weak part of the self that we then project onto other groups, onto other, we'll let them be the carriers of the, the bad experiences and that can keep me free of it. We use a lot of psychological defense mechanisms, right? We don't wanna think, most people don't wanna think I'm a bad person. So I will just kind of push aside the parts of myself that don't consider the impact on other people. I'm just gonna kind of push that out of my mind. That's a sort of disavowal. And mm -hmm. then I can go on with life as I want it to be. I think we have trouble thinking that there are limitations to our lives. Most of us don't like to think we're gonna die someday. I mean, that's at, at the most basic level, much less that there are harms happening that we participate in. Um, so I, I think there's so many forces and then the polarization that happens like let's let's see those other people those um those other qualities are different from me and so i'm gonna kind of uh circle my own wagon and keep things close to me that feel similar and that's problematic 
And, and it's and it, and it, and it, it, it brings to mind, you know, when we look at some of the, one of the mega trends is this kind of globalization of ideas and narratives. And I think part of what we're seeing, at least in this country, is there was a very, we, we had a narrative about kind of the status of America, right? And, and as globalization kind of truly set in, that created a rupture for a lot of folks um, who were it, it's certain socioeconomic. And in that rupture, there's kind of a blowback and a backlash, right? And so the question is how, as, as we want to move forward, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you another big one, Wendy. If, if, if you had this kind of magic wand um, and, and you could say something as a psychologist to folks who are having this real problem of kind of letting go and acceptance and that it's going to be okay. Like, how would you frame that? Like, because it seems like a lot of our, and where I'm coming from is something that Majora made me think of our kind of the industrial messaging complex for cause campaigns is never directed at kind of the internalness of someone trying to flourish or, or people in pain, internal pain, right? It's always, it's always kind of binary and it's, you have to stop this person from doing this, but there isn't this kind of Dawn's idea of kind of this mutuality. So how would, what, how do we have to start thinking and talking to one another to kind of move us out of this polarization in a way that allows people to, to come together, not in a Pollyannish way, but to address these changes that we need to start addressing if we want to make it, if homo sapiens are going to make it for the next several decades. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to start with Wendy, but I want to hear from everyone on this one. Yeah, and I'd be very interested in hearing other people's um, responses because I sort of probably have one particular perspective. I'm a couples therapist, so I am in the practice of trying to get people who are struggling with difference um, to find common ground. So I think sometimes that's the heart of it is, is really seeing where the overlap is, really seeing what people care about and if there can be some kind of empathy for what the pain is or what the struggle is and find find the, the, the overlap in values, the overlap in care, uh, helping people uh, speak from their more vulnerable parts so that the other person, you know, polarization happens when we feel attacked, again, sort of threatened, and then we get more reactive or defensive. And so moving away from the defensive place to really listening and getting to know each other. And I know this, this does sound sort of Pollyanna-ish, but I think that it's at the heart of sort of the, the human condition. And I'm, I'm liking seeing Majora nodding, so I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts. Majora. I think it's, no, that is it. I mean, as, as, as a member, card carrying member of the nonprofit, excuse me, of the low status community because I'm a recovering member of the nonprofit industrial complex, even though I now work for one now. Um, but it was, it, the, the, the damage was done, but it, I'm older and stronger now. So, but anywho, the, but I do, I actually absolutely believe in the promise of America. I absolutely believe that we have the capacity to see each other and in particular, those from outside of not of um excuse me of low status communities can see us you know as human if they wanted to like i really do believe that and i also believe that the damage that white supremacy and systemic racism and you know persistent jarring inequality has done to the psyche of people from those communities is also i think um relieved i mean just the the fact that you know mutual aid which is a, it's a big deal it's been going on for forever um you know pe we we know inherently that we're like beautiful fearfully wonderfully made and on some level that is deep down inside of all of us and we act accordingly so i believe that you know it just look as i'm a woman of faith and so i'm like unfortunately i'm like oh, you know what this isn't all there is thank god but um the other part is that we do have the capacity if we want it to be. We have let, you know, structural bias and everything else get in the way of in particular by seeing, you know, people of less means as less than. But it doesn't mean that we have to continue to do that all the time. I really and I'm seeing some more of that going forward, both in my own uh, private practice and also, you know, in the fact like, frankly, what Justice 40 came up and I was just like, 
there are people who actually believe this too. And they came to me to help. And I'm like, okay, so I'm feeling quite good about myself right now and about humanity, which is a, a good place for me to be. Good place for all of us. Don, uh, if you're, if, if, if you, I, I saw you shaking your head, if you, want to, if you want to come in on this kind of like, how do we think about this? Because as we look at these mega trends, and I said at the very beginning, they're, they're not necessarily positive, they're positive, negative, and neutral, and it's how we work with them. So when you think about the next, you know, the, you, you're funding on a yearly basis, but if you think about the funding as almost a, um, a trim tab, right? So the, the, uh, a quick digression, Buckminster Fuller, the famous architect engineer, was asked during World War II to help the Navy figure out how to steer these giant battleships because it had gotten to the point where the, the, the battleships and cargo ships were so large that they couldn't build a hydraulic system big enough to actually turn the rudder. So he came up with this idea, only a four inch piece of steel called the trim tab, and that if, if there was just enough power applied to the trim tab, it would create a negative pressure current and pull the rest of the rudder around. So the trim tab has two components. One, it's a small action that over time has very large ramifications, but two, and this is the one that people never want to necessarily wrestle with, you have to go against the current a little bit, right? You have to go into the negative pressure to create the power to turn the whole thing. So as you're hearing this and you're and we're thinking and we're wrestling with these negatives we want to shape, how do you think about these kind of trim tab opportunities to get us where you would like or you and, and the foundation and the board to kind of get us where we need to be to be in a right state as a, as a society 20, 30 years out from now. But, and I should mention both on the technical, but also because your foundation also funds kind of cultural community artistic endeavors. So it's not just frontline in the classic sense. So how does, how does your thinking uh, wrestle with this? Well, I, I think uh, your example of the trim tab is absolutely beautiful and poetic. Um, I can see you establishing a trim tab institute alongside Long Path someday. Um, yeah, I think this is a really key question. Um, when I think about futures and scenarios and um, uh, you know some of these megatrends, one of the things that I think is often missing, uh, which you do highlight in, in your analysis, um, is the the need for a change in values. Uh, and you use the word narratives. I, I feel like um, narratives are so, so powerful. They're really under the radar. They're deeply embedded in our culture. And um, if we are to create the future that we want to create, we can't just focus on technology and economic policy and all those types of things. We really have to have a revolution in values, which is one of the things that Reverend William Barber talks about. Um, I think it's absolutely essential. Um, uh, when I think about uh, the work that, um, you know, in my sector in particular, um, I think there is more of a reckoning um, because, uh, you know, it is a, you know, phil philanthropy industrial complex. I think there's been a lot of groupthink and trends within our sector. Um, and, you know, we can talk about that all day long about like how um, different things become fashionable, come and go within our sector. but. Right now, one of the things that is promising is that there's more of an emphasis in trust-based practices. Um, people call it trust-based philanthropy, which is similar to what I was describing before in um, you know, foundations doing more long-term general support, funding more at the community level, um, trying to like create fewer burdens and hurdles uh, for applicants and things like that. Um, and obviously, you know, for foundations, there's there's some things that we can do. There's some things that you know are going to be harder to come by, um, like you know, spending down all the uh, endowment resources and things like that. Um, so I think, but I, I do think uh, this positive trend of you know more trust-based uh, approaches is positive, and it's in the context of more and more commentators really shining a light on philanthropy as uh, a sector that is a creature of our tax law um, and the fact that, you know, um, this is uh, the least accountable sector in American society. Uh, you know, we have very few legal requirements. Um, uh, if we have endowments, then, you know, we're set. We don't have the pressure of, you know, making uh, profits or whatnot. So 
Um, so I think this accountability and criticism and commentary is really welcome. And that's one of the things that I think um, we absolutely need. Um, the last thing I'll say about this topic, just to go back to what Wendy was saying, um, is I would love to see um, more foundations and just more, you know, folks involved in, in, the, in the public square talking about how we can uh, bridge differences uh, and come together in this divided world. And going back to the trim tab um, uh, metaphor that you used, uh, as we think about the rise in technology and social media and all that stuff, you know, a lot of folks thought that it would make the world more intimate, that people would have more empathy for each other because they would be more connected and they would see each other. But instead, I think a lot of what we've, we've seen is the opposite. People have moved in, you know, their own, you know, clusters and, you know, uh, have uh, have uh, gone to groupthink in their uh, in their different um, you know uh, areas, uh, and I wonder if there is you know a way which that can be turned around uh, to towards more empathy and understanding and a little bit more commonality. That's something that I think about a lot. That's really interesting because I was thinking, you know, when you were saying a, a lot of this, I was thinking about something I've heard Ari say a lot about sort of kind algorithms and, you know, could we build technology that reflects our values? Because I think, you know, all three of you were saying stuff about kind of how do we be more expansive in the human condition in a way. And at least I'll, I'll just put my own words in it. And I'll, I was thinking about how do we put our best values forward of empathy, of compassion and not be in this sort of, you know, fight or flight money that I think you aptly talked about, which, you know, change can be scary. And we know that there is going to be huge changes in this country and in the globe, you know, whether it's from climate change or any other number of these you know, factors. And it was funny also, Don, when you were saying philanthropy is the least regulated sector, I was like, what about the tech sector? <laughs> so, you know, I do think that is, a, that is a component of it. And I think, you know, I want to just clarify my own thinking and my own thoughts earlier, I am a very much, I'm a, I'm a policy person. I'm a political scientist by training. I spent a lot of time at policy school. Um, I think policy does matter and institutions do matter, but it's a question of how they can be more adaptive and participatory and reflective and inclusive. And, you know, we've never had a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy in the U.S. in the true sense. And so what do the policies need to look like that reflect it, you know, if, and I'm just sort of, you know, throwing spaghetti on the wall, but when I think about some of these things, the sort of existential angst that people feel, right? If everyone knew that they had guaranteed health care, guaranteed paid leave, right? Guaranteed UBI, for example, like a universal basic income. Like, I'm not saying that's necessarily the right one, but this is sort of the things to think about. You know, I've been working with a lot of mayors on these kind of, um, guaranteed income pilots and Newark has launched a really interesting one where they did participatory assemblies and I was sort of helping them think about it alongside this guaranteed income pilot and it was so interesting right because something that really did happen under the Trump administration during COVID is that we gave direct cash transfer to people and lo and behold like it works right I mean, like for years I've been sort of talking about can we empower people and give them the dollars to make their choices and you know, lo and behold, we, we did a huge thing like this and, and it was, I think it was effective. I mean, I, I don't know all the data and the outcomes, but it's just something to think about, right? Could our institutions and our technology and our structures, I mean, one of the things that I think a lot about is like, what we have is not how it has to be. And it's sort of both doing a descriptive understanding of where we are in our civic muscles as a society, but then really thinking normatively, what would it look like? to build the kind of robust participatory multiracial multi-ethnic democracy of the future and what would the mechanisms look like tech platforms right should they be private should we have sort of social pro social pro civic tech platforms like there's different ways that we could be structuring and thinking about this stuff that maybe could be more in align with our humanity and and maybe if you were able to do it on a long term basis you could kind of you know, ease some of that angst. I don't know, it won't ease all of the angst and it won't ease all the racism and all of the structural inequities, but maybe it would it would begin. I, I create a different kind of foundation. I don't know, just a thought. And you know, it's, I, I wanna, uh, I'm gonna bring in Felicia and Rowling in just a second, but you, you bring up, Holly, this 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 point uh, that we, from from Kai, we, we touched on this last last time we were all together, which is if, if you, 
if you don't have a vision in mind of where you want to go, you're never going to get there. And it seems like we've lost that. You know, there was, there's, you know, I'll, I'll go back to, you know, the Old Testament. Like we knew as we were leaving Egypt, there was this land of milk and we knew we wanted to leave and go to something. And as a country, I'll, 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 even though I know we have people viewing from around the world, as a country, what that kind of milk and honey looks like, that land. And by the way, that land, not as a noun, but as a verb, because what I'm hearing is that we know it's a kind of this continual process. We're never, we're never there, but once we get there, it, the work doesn't get easier. We, we're just more in the flow of it, right? And it, and it feels like um, we kind of lost that, that bigger vision, or we had one, we had a narrative, but some folks called the question on it and we saw that it wasn't real for everyone. It was for a very, you know, certain section of the population that access to it, but not everyone else did. Um, Rolly and Felicia, if, if, if you're there in the Zoom server network uh, and, and if David could kind of unmute you, I want to know kind of as, as you guys are hearing this, because it's part of a series, what is this bringing to mind for you in terms of some of the questions from last week or what we're going to be going into next week and kind of Take, take us through that as we kind of come on the on the back slope of this conversation. Uh, I can start with Felicia Rolly, whichever one. Go ahead. Um, I mean, a lot's been said, I think some of which I feel like has been in our soup for a long time and um, both like as religious people who are, I think, oriented toward faith and have essentially that kind of promised land mentality um, that is always pushing towards something that's not present. Um, I think there's that sense of longing that is so profound, um, which is a driver, I think, for a lot of the change that's so necessary. I think the challenge of that, too, is in some way what you just brought up and I think what has been mentioned in so many ways is that the deconstruction that is happening in our time um, around what we thought our country was, at least for those of us who are uh, have been in the privileged uh, sector of our country, um, and, and does that mean that actually our longings are obscured? Um, and so I think there's been a lot of paralysis around change um, because we're trying to deconstruct what we have been built on while also longing for something else. And it's very hard to hold both at the same time. And I, I would say in a religious community, that's true also, right? Both we have a deeply patriarchal tradition that I am deeply in love with. And as I push forward as a faithful um committed rabbi in that tradition I'm deconstructing as I'm also pushing forward and also recognizing that our community holds um, standards or assumptions that is not as expansive even if it's loving and committed and so you know as we're we're also struggling with our diversity equity inclusion work around misogyny and around racism and all the things that we've been intoxicated with from this country and our tradition too. And yet we we kind of sometimes get paralyzed because we don't know how to move forward as we're trying to understand ourselves at the same time. Um, so I think that's why um, it's such a profound question in the different avenues that folks have been, we're really blessed this evening to hear from so many different, different voices, but there's like a convergence I think around one really thinking about home, like home base, the local space and our local responsibility and our local deconstruction. Um, and also in order to um, really think about what's my ownership of, of investing really where I am to push forward to that future while also not disconnecting with the larger universe um, that without that sense of connection, um, we won't be able to move forward to some common good, some milk and honey, some promised land. Um, so I, I feel like, you know, and, and in some way I would say, just the last thing, I'm happy to pass it over to Roly. One of the things I, 
you know, I think that we, this year has exposed is, um, is the rawness of the, of the exposition of everything, the vulnerability um, of what it means to have to let go of things. Those of us, you know, even who are not in more marginalized spaces have had to let go of a lot. And how do we really um, use this letting go, forced letting go as a recovery period um, to kind of recognize that what we've been holding on to um, has actually been an illusion. Um, and so how do we use that as a recovery for what is that deepest place that Majora spoke about, which is that we're all creating God's image and, and how do we use this period? So I feel like religiously, that's also been part of our, our Torah of this time, our teaching of this time is that um, the exposure, I mean, in religious life, exposure while painful and hard to look it in the face is actually the greatest the greatest motivator if we're willing to take it on and um i think that's we're living in in those tensions when when we've desired a lot of comfort but actually it's the rawness that will be our powerful motivator towards a new future preach So I, I, uh, I mean, uh, um, Felicia, you talk about deconstruction, and I'm, I'm thinking also, and uh, and you know, we're talking about going to some sort of promised land somewhere out there that we don't really know, that we imagine, that we envision. But I think also there is a piece of reconstruction. You know, there's a piece of going back, going back to something that is very deep in the in the fabric of reality in the in the structure of reality in the structure of the universe which is a lot of what our faith traditions uh, do which is to remind us of things that we forgot you know to to connect us back through our narratives and through our rituals you know to connect us back to something very ancient that is that is what we're going to find in that promised land but but is the also at the point of departure, you know, it's, it's, uh, is what you just said, you know, we're cre all created in God's image in the sense that we all have infinite value, that we're really interconnected, we forget about this. The teachings that say don't take more than you need, the teachings that says pause and rest and contemplate before you move forward, you know, all these, all these very, very sort of very deep values that a lot of our religious traditions um, um, share, you know, which is uh, sort of re remembering what we have forgotten. And I think a lot of this work that, you know, we heard about tonight, which is, you know, cutting edge and it's so, so wonderful and so hopeful. I mean, I think we all experienced in the last couple of years, in the last few years with, you know, the last administration in particular, but not exclusively. And also with, with the pandemic, you know, a, a sort of a breaking of the fabric, a, uh, um, a, a sense of despair, you know, with, with, uh, in terms of, of, of racism, in terms of nationalism, fascism, in terms of, of, uh, of the situation of, you know, of, the, of health, of greed, and individualism, all that stuff. I mean, like the fabric, it was torn big time. And, we hear all these wonderful people, I mean, really doing brilliant and wonderful things, giving us a sense of there, there are people doing stuff, you know, that is really important, that is, that is wonderful, that is hopeful, that is visionary. And it gives you a sense that it, it's not all broken. But a lot of this work, I feel, is not just sort of being, you know, we're not just being pulled by the by the future, by the hope of the promised land, but we're also going back to something very, very human, very basic that I think we've, we've either, we've either lost or we, or we never really got. And we have to reconnect with that. And I, I feel that a lot of what was said is, is a lot of, of that reconnection. In, in, in Hebrew, I mean, for those of us who are part of the Jewish tradition, it's called Teshuvah, and it's, it's going, it's, 
it's some sort of a return to the future. You know, it's not just a return to the past. It's a return to, to something that is future-oriented and that is healing-oriented and repair-oriented. And I think that's... that's I, I think this is the opportunity of this moment. Uh, thank you, Roly and Felicia. And I want to thank Majora, Don, Wendy and Holly. Uh, there's a lot of things you guys could have done tonight and you chose to be with us and to be with this community to share a lot of the work that you're working on, your thoughts, your feelings, um, your heart, your mind. And, and, I, and, I'm, and I thank you for that. And um, there's, there's going to be more because this is part of a series. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm, we're going to close at this part. I'm going to uh, give that over to, to Felicia and she's going to give us a little bit more about what's to come next. Great. Thank you so much, Ari. And uh, once again, thank you to Don and Majora and Holly and Wendy for this incredible conversation. To let everyone know that um, next week on Wednesday night, same time, same place, uh, at at 7.30, we'll be having a BJ only um, experience. We'll, you know, this was a very Zoom out uh, uh, thinking around mega trends and, and different sectors of the society and what we're learning both in the short term and in the long term and what work really is, really spoke to, to like has been seeded and is all these uh, incredible folks are doing in the world to help move us toward that promised land. Next week will really be about the, the uniqueness of the individual to think about our own story at this time and um, moving from a very big picture to a very me and I space um, in the context of spiritual life and community. Um, so we invite all, all BJ members to come at 7.30 next week for a, a, a learning and a kind of a spiritual exploration of what's been our own unique learning during this time and how do we as you individuals really want to s move into this new story, the new Torah that will come down the teaching uh, on Shavuot. Um, so we hope everyone will, will join us. Uh, um, will join us uh, for, for next week and then we'll culminate uh, on Shavuot evening for our tikkun on Sunday, May 16th um, at 8.15 where we'll begin with an evening service to begin the holiday and then have a conversation with uh, Dr. Uh, Serene Jones, Reverend Serene Jones of Union Theological Seminary and Rabbi Dr. Shaul Magid around really religious life and thinking about these issues. Um, so thank you everyone. And uh, I think Roly will conclude with counting the Omer. Uh, so for those, you want to just say a moment, Roly, about what the counting of the Omer is? The counting of the Omer, for those who uh, are not familiar with it, is, uh, is the counting of each day from the holiday of Passover until the holiday of Shavuot. It's a journey of 49 days. Each day is an individual specific day that has specific uh, spiritual work to be done and to be achieved and to be contemplated on that particular day. So uh, we are going to uh, begin with uh, um, a, a blessing, uh, setting the intention and then uh, count the actual night to night. So, um, page 237 for those who have a Siddur. So we counted 38 last night, didn't we? I am ready to fulfill the mitzvah of counting the Omer. As it is ordained in the Torah, you shall count from the eve of the second day of Pesach, when an Omer of grain is to be brought as an offering seven complete weeks. The day after the seventh week of your counting will make 50 days. By the way, tonight we are going to count uh, 
נצח שביסוד. נצח is big, something that is long lasting, talking about long path, ambition, big vision. And the week in which we are is the week of Yesod, which means the foundation, the place in which we, we rest all of the qualities, that, all of the attributes that came before love and boundaries and discipline and truth and beauty and, in this case, ambition and vision, all these things coming together into that foundation to then come and be embodied in reality. So tonight is Netzach Shebe Yesod. Baruch Ata Anunai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kidishanu Bemitzvotah Vetzivanu Al Sefirat HaOmer Hayom Tisha Ushloshim Yom Shehem Chamisha Shavuot Vearbaa Yamim LaOmer Thanks, everyone. We want to give a uh, uh, thank you to uh, David and Alexandra Stern, who have so generously supported uh, this work through the work of the foundation, and uh, to Cantor Dave Mintz, who's been uh, coordinating and shepherding the whole process. Have a good night, everyone. Lila Tov.